Okay, well, it's a very rainy afternoon, and uh, I appreciate everyone coming. I suspect we'll have some more people uh, wandering in as we start. But, um, you know, when you get this kind of a group together, uh, it's just kind of a special op opportunity and a time. And so I, I really very much appreciate you joining us here today. I'm going to say in advance that, uh, unfortunately, Professor uh, Kilnam Chung is not able to join us. Uh, came down with a very, very bad cold, and we and he felt it was probably better if he stayed in Missouri. He was going to fly here this morning. Uh, so, um, I had hoped for a great picture. Uh, great friends, Japan, Korea, China, and the United States. Uh, great pioneers on the internet, Japan, Korea, China, the United States, all together on one platform. Uh, but that just means we'll have to do it again. And uh, I hope that the, uh, the nature of the discussion is going to persuade you that this is something that uh, we probably can't do enough. So, on behalf of, uh, of Keio University, I do want to wel welcome uh, our pioneers. Uh, I'm going to briefly uh, introduce uh, uh, Professor Farber, and then as we get into the conversation, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, go ahead and introduce the, uh, the different other members of our panel. Uh, I think that probably most people in this room are quite familiar with Professor Farber uh, and his work. He has been one of the major people that have been um, uh, working on the internet and uh, a lot of his early work uh, informed uh, the basic uh, structure, I'm not supposed to use the word architecture, uh, <laughs> of, of, of the internet. Uh, and he continues today to be an active voice uh, throughout uh, the internet world in terms of helping us think through what the next steps are. Uh, and so I'm, I can't tell you how pleased I am uh, to have him here, and we hope to have a really uh, dynamic uh, conversation while he's here. What I'd like to do now is, certainly in the interest of time, is to um, ask um, uh, Professor Kokorio, uh, who is our Vice President for International Collaboration, uh, to say a few welcoming remarks, and then we're going to kind of jump in uh, to kind of an informal conversation among the many people in Asia, the many young people in Asia, uh, that Professor Farber uh, uh, developed, mentored, nurtured, and that are now playing very, very critical roles uh, in the development of the internet here in um, in this part in this part of the world. So uh, let me just turn the mic over to uh, Professor Kokurio. Uh Good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> uh, as introduced, uh, my name is Tiro uh, Kokurio. Thanks, we friends here. Uh, so, uh, 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 Vice President of, uh, of this university uh, uh, in charge of international collaboration. Uh, but in addition to that, I have been uh, a very keen researcher on the social impact and the economic impact of the uh, internet. And it's, in that regard, I am thrilled uh, by this opportunity of uh, having uh, uh, Professor Farber visit us uh, uh, again. He, he's been, he's been uh, I mean, a, a great member uh, for, uh, for us. Not just the academics, but uh, many of the entrepreneurs, uh, at least in this country, uh, around, around the internet, have been inspired uh, by, by Professor Farber. And uh, so, so he's, he's been uh, really the guiding light. Uh, for, for us all, and of course to have him and uh, and, and professor to have professor C. C. Lin and uh, and and of course Jun and Topla San Bilinki and uh, Adam and really Miss Kilden, but uh, uh, to, to to have all, all the all these people uh, to reflect on. The past, but I think that we reflect on the past to think about our future. So I hope I'm really looking forward to uh, what Dave 
has to say about the, how, our future. So, uh, and then this, I mean, let's take this, I mean, the advantage of a relatively compact group. So, I hope to have a very lively uh, discussion uh, uh, around uh, how, you know, where we came from and where we're going to go uh, from here. And thank you for uh, gathering. Well, let me move now from uh, basically from my left through my right to just briefly introduce uh, the other panelists here. I'm sure to most of you they're very, very well known. Adam Peake, uh, of course, uh, originally uh, uh, Executive uh, Research Director at Glowcom, at Glowcom, which was uh, really kind of the first internet think tank research group uh, here uh, in Japan. But in that respect, uh, Adam, I would almost argue probably in Asia. Uh, and Adam, of course, has seen it all. Uh, most recently, he's played a very, very key, key role in uh, articulating some of the basic principles that came out of the NetMovieL process. Uh, he's with ICANN now. And so it's really kind of been at the center of this process uh, for a long, long time. And uh, delighted that he's able to, uh, uh, to join us. Uh, he's got a, quite a very busy schedule. My colleague uh, uh, at Keio University and our uh, a dean of the Faculty of Environment and Information Studies, uh, Professor Jun Marai. Uh, I will tell you, he flew all the way back uh, from Okinawa, uh, probably arrived minutes ago, uh, directly from the airport. Uh, and so, very, very happy that, uh, that he's joined us. He, of course, in some way, was the first person that, that acquainted me with the connection between Dave and the rest of Asia. Uh, he's famously quoted as saying that uh, Dave, and we, I think we almost take this, not literally, but figuratively, is the grandfather of the internet uh, in Asia. Jun, of course, uh, is, is widely known as the father of the internet in Asia. Uh, Kil Nam, who was going to join us, uh, played a catalytic role in Korea. He's known basically as the father of the uh, internet uh, in Korea, but also more broadly in uh, other parts of Asia. And of course, uh, the next person I'll be introducing, Professor Shane Lee, who played that similar role. So, um, delighted that uh, uh, Jun Murai is here. We were together at a cybersecurity conference uh, yesterday down in Okinawa. Over 300 people uh, attended. And again, I think, you know, time after time, uh, he's not only working hard to develop the internet here in Japan, but also has a very, very clear vision as to where it needs to go uh, in the rest of Asia but how it connects as well uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, Professor Shing Li is someone uh, I've come only to know very, very recently, but he has been around working on the internet. He has a PhD from Drexel University, uh, returned to China, and was instrumental in, or in creating what is called the Chinese Education Research Network, which exists even today. In 1994, that was kind of the progenitor, or the start, of the Chinese internet. And I don't need to tell any of you that the Chinese internet now uh, has more people on the internet than all of the United States, all of Europe, and all of Japan combined. And the basic structure for that internet and continuing uh, to lead that internet is uh, Professor Lee. So we're very, very uh, grateful that he's uh, agreed to join us. Also down, I think I, I, we should have this in Okinawa. Also down in Okinawa was uh, Professor Tokuda, uh, who uh, worked for a period of time at Carnegie Mellon University, which is where uh, Professor Farber was uh, was talking. And you will see shortly a um, a very uh, uh, interesting picture of. Uh, certain members of uh, this very, very elite group in younger days. Uh, which shows you there is a start and there is hope for you all. Or for us, I should say all of us. Uh, Professor Tokut, of course, is uh, one of our top networks, experts on network security. Uh, he's been working very, very hard, particularly on that kind of next uh, generation of, of the Internet, the Internet of Things, and particularly in that context, how the Internet of Things will fundamentally uh, force us perhaps to change uh, the uh, the framework or architecture, some of the basic building principles around the uh, the internet. So, I'm going to divide 
uh, the session into two parts. Uh, the first part, which will basically run between 3.15 and 3.45, uh, in other words, for the next half hour. I'd like each of our um, uh, distinguished guests, uh, except for Dave, because we're going to put him on the spot a bit, to reminisce a bit about their first meetings with Dave, uh, their, their thoughts about the role that Dave has played in bringing this marvelous technology and all the benefits associated with it to this part of the world. And towards the end of the session, as, we, as the conversation deepens, I'll be asking uh, Dave to comment, though I'm sure there's going to be a lot of back and forth. And I do encourage everyone uh, to speak uh, very, very freely to the extent that we can keep the mics uh, with you. Uh, just to remind everyone, uh, the um, entire uh, uh, symposium today is being recorded. Uh, so, and we will be putting it up on the internet, so be aware of that, at least in terms of what you say and what you do. Uh, but also, uh, it makes it incredibly important that when you do have something to say, that you identify who you are and you speak into the mic. Okay, so that uh, I think that uh, we're going to have a tremendous number of, uh, of people that want to see this, and hopefully it will become a uh, kind of record of uh, where we are and who we are at this point in time in terms of the, uh, the internet in Asia. We certainly have people, I think, that can uh, that benchmark it for us today. From 3.45 to 4.30 then, what I want to do is shift the conversation and have Dave and this other distinguished group talk a little bit about uh, not only where we've been, because that's the first part, but to talk about the future. What about the future architecture of the internet? What's happening to trust? What about fragmentation? What about cybersecurity? Those kinds of things. How is it going to change? Does virtual re is virtual reality going to change reality? What about artificial intelligence? I mean, and in that particular segment, I'm going to be throwing out some ideas and questions, but I want you to jump in because this is your chance. Uh, and so, I'm giving you a little bit of forewarning. Think down to yourself. If you had Dave Farber in your living room. <laughs> and with him were uh, some of the leading experts on the internet uh, in Asia. If they were in your living room and you could ask them and talk with them about anything you want, this is your chance. Okay? So not a formal stiff question, but something that you really want to know because that's what I think we want to get down on video and share for the, uh, for the future. So I'm going to kind of uh, get out of the way and I'm going to initially uh, uh, turn over uh, uh, the, the mic to the father of the internet in Japan, Professor Murai. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, so the first round is going to be what I, how I love with, uh, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I can only permit to talk about Dave. No. Okay. Oh, really? Okay, so, uh, yeah, but uh, probably I'd like to, yeah, I mean, thank you for coming. And, uh, and then I think Fred Baker sitting in there is a very special occasion. So uh, I think uh, I wonder I can move him to sit there. <laughs> Fred has been leading the author, I did efforts in this Cisco and everything, and he knows about the internet probably uh, it's from the uh, US and uh, longer, and therefore probably. Can you identify that person, Neil? Oh, oh the, uh, okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, let me, let me start with uh, this picture. Thank you very much. And, uh, um, uh, okay, the, uh, how, how everything start was there? Uh, uh, yeah, from uh, this picture, I think, uh, I mean, the other relationship about the network in this country and the other thing. So, the, the, uh, first of all, the probably, you can say, I mean, something else. How, how much time, by, by the way? Two hours? No, no, no. <laughs> no. We're going to spend about a half hour on this, but I mean, we're just going to let it roll. So, I feel like I'm not going to see two hours. Um, uh, okay, um, the internet. The internet was uh, uh, probably a lot of uh, uh, 
wrong story about the internet. Even Wikipedia is not talking about the, uh, you know, the true story about the internet. What the internet is, and the, you know, that kind of thing. And the how, basically. I and mean, most of the Japanese literature, by the way, the, the internet was the, the American military things, and then exporting to, to Japan. Okay, and the Viking back. So that, that's a wrong story. Um, the, the true story, to, to my understanding, everybody can fix me. Um, the, the network, computer network was everywhere. And the, I mean, some countries. And the, the, the point is how we going to interconnect those networks, and what kind of protocol we need. And uh, for the first time, the Dave uh, played a very important role on a CS net. And they are supposed to email based, based network and uh, how they going to be connected. And the protocol design and everything uh, was done by David's group. So in Japan, uh, we had a, our, our own uh, email based network called JUNet uh, since 84. And uh, therefore, uh, obviously, the JUNet was the almost only first uh, email based network in this country. Therefore, the, uh, of course, uh, uh, global connection, international connection uh, basis was uh, JUNet, and uh, then they you know, uh, interconnect that JUNet with the whatever the network, I mean, including the ARPANET, email version, email part of the ARPANET, uh, e, uh, Britain board part of the ARPANET, and the, those are the messages. Therefore, we could uh, interconnect those uh, email message, text message based uh, uh, exchange uh, to the Japanese JU net. So that's uh, basically the CS net and the JU net uh, connectivity. But the not represented in this picture, but I don't know where this picture was put in, in here or in Korea. Okay. I mean, in Korea. But, but the point is, point is this group. Uh, and I think I uh, think visited visited uh, Korea, so uh, uh, before before coming to Japan, and uh, then uh, including Kilman and the other person, uh, then uh, uh, we worked on a uh, uh, Pacific uh, communication symposium or something in uh, Seoul, and uh, then uh, on the way back from uh, Korea, then uh, they were uh, drafting here, and uh, then uh, we talked about the interconnection of a CSNet and the JUNet. So that's a, a basically the story. So the key people from the US side on that trip was, uh, uh, of course, Dave and the Larry Land River and uh, a Mark Holton who did the Unix network, uh, Usenet, uh, in the United States with uh, his wife. So uh, uh, those are the good friends of uh, those people. So. Uh, we can ignore this person. <laughs> this is no, 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 Kishida san. Kishida san is a very important person because uh, uh, he paid all my trip during that time. <laughs> so, uh, he was a guardian angel for the traveling to the United States. He was uh, he was a sponsor uh, on myself. So uh, this Jumura is standing here because he was supporting uh, blindly. So anything I want to I want to go to a Unix conference and I want to go I want to write a paper and then the submitting the paper but that's unfortunately in New York City and then he's paying everything so I, I want to buy a computer and he was paying so <laughs> he was a great great sponsor so uh, then the next person is uh, no both uh, so uh, uh, he's uh, uh, also, SFC found one of the SFC found. So, uh, you probably don't identify this person. <laughs> <laughs> I was that, that, that one long time ago. This one was bad. So, so basically, the, uh, I'm the finish. I'm the finish. Oh, okay, I just wanted to throw one in. Uh, if my memory serves me right, and maybe it doesn't, I think. Long time ago. Uh, one of the great motivators here was Professor ISO. Because uh, ISO, when I was at Irvine, right. came over and spent a, a month uh, working with us on the on our distributed system. And we established a good friendship. 
and I, he was key to bringing together the uh, the CSNet people. We were essentially Johnny Appleseeds yeah. that works in the uh, Japanese context. We we had a network at hand, and we were trying to get others. So yeah, I would like to add to that point. But uh, back to uh, mid seventies. There was no notion of distributed computing in Japan at all. So when Professor Iso visited Dave's lab, after he came back to Keio, he wanted to create our own mini computer network using uh, high tech tail, or 4300, or whatever. I have a picture of this, but um, then um, we actually, you had a ring network. We tried to create the uh, bus type uh, mini computer network. And then uh, Professor Iso asked a bunch of students to create a uh, uh, network. That was actually started the uh, distributed computing movement. Yeah, and uh, also, yeah, from a human network point of view, uh, yeah, Dave is right. And uh, uh, really, the, it started with the Dave Iso senses, uh, you know, relationship, friendship. And uh, then, they, yeah, we, we, we had a lot. Uh, from uh, ISO Sensei about the date, and then also uh, probably uh, uh, Haruhi Sai Ishida Sensei was in the University of Tokyo also uh, uh, in this this round, I mean, time frame, and uh, then you know, that's what we, how we started. But it's not the TCP time, it's the time, right? Yeah, yeah. Let me just jump now and ask. Uh, uh, Professor Lead to kind of jump ahead almost 10 years uh, and talk about his time in the, in the United States, uh, relationship with Dave Farber, and how this new technology actually kind of landed in China. Uh, I think it was in your suitcase, right? <laughs> oh, okay, good afternoon. Excuse me. Okay, I, actually, I'm not in the CS world. Originally, I'm WE, and I did my master and PhD in the United States in the ultrasound signal processing. And by that time, actually, it's no network to network is 1983 to 91. So originally, I tried to use IBM SpeedNet, then UUCP, and later I heard in the mass department there is a computer connected to UPN. So that's connect to internet. So I go to the professors and ask for a count, and uh, so I got a count. So oh, that's written? Uh, no, that's the internet. Inter so internet that's to you better. Yeah, okay. yeah, right, right. That's only oh, CS okay. department. In, <clears throat> I mean, the, okay, I'm, I was in Drexel University next door to UPA, oh, okay. and so that, that's the thing, and uh, that's really open a new world for me, and uh, I have tried to download open source software, and I found actually the richest site is in Japan. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of download to my, to the computer, I mean, my account. And I heard later, like the professor in CS department told, this is, internet is very good. So students download software from Japan to the United States, but actually I'm a Chinese. So I came back to China in 1991, and I found there is no networking activity, and like the master and students try to get the degree for write a JPEG comparison argument. I told them, okay, that's on the internet, you can free download. Why? We still net energy. And later, actually, there are some projects initiated by the Ministry of Education, and luckily I participated for that. The reason I, I was chosen for that is, in 1991, I shouted aloud and told people, we need internet, we need internet, we need internet. So that's thought, I'm an internet expert, actually I'm not, so I'm just a user, but I'm quite lucky to get into this. Maybe I share other experiences <coughs> on that. Oh, by the way, I met David Faber quite long, more than ten years ago. <coughs> Actually, there is a, some kind of computation called Global Bangling Challenge in the city of Stockholm. Yes. So actually, I was 
on the board with them. David Farber, and uh, actually, people told me, okay, David Farber is very big name because he's the grandfather of the internet. So I actually, in the late days of my lecture, I always talk to my students, you have to work hard. If, and someday I can be the great father of something. <laughs> so that's the story I always talk about. Uh, well, you know, Professor Lee is the great father of 700 million users on the internet <laughs> in China. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary if you think what has happened over the past 20 years in China. And frankly, without uh, Professor Lee's leadership then, but actually his continued leadership now. And I think one of the things that really uh, Professor Lee exemplifies in his work is that he's understood that the, that the internet is about collaboration, not competition. And he's connected with everyone through bonds of friendship, but also just from working together on a lot of these very, very tough problems of the internet. Can I ask our, our, our latest guest? Fred, is, Fred Baker. Yeah, Fred, be a truth teller here. Uh, where, how did it really get started? <laughs> well, and, and, what were, and what role did these guys play? Well, the, the, the song. Which is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so my perception is that the internet started many times in many places. Uh, it didn't start in just one place. And, and they weren't all simultaneously, but they weren't necessarily in different places either. Um, when I'm talking about this, I find myself talking about Al Gore. And of course, we all know that Al Gore invented the internet. <laughs> uh, what Al Gore actually did to do that was important was he got money. And uh, so, in various places in the world, uh, Dr. Bill and John uh, implemented RFC 760 in Korea in 1982. We talk about the internet starting in 1983. It didn't. It started before that. Uh, and you know, there were a lot of important experiments going on. Um, but it was disconnected. It, frankly, didn't work very well. Uh, there were, in 1988, we had a grand total of 173 routes on the internet. Now we have something like half a million, or you know, approaching 600,000 routes. Uh, we had 173 in 1988. Uh, and and it's, it's grown dramatically. But, uh, Al Gore went and got money given to the NSF to say, so let's um, let, let's let's get some different experiments going. We want to connect different supercomputers on it. And so the Barrett Network was an important one of those. CSNet was an important one of those. Uh, I was involved with a uh, satellite-based network called USIM. Uh, if you've heard the term Martian packets, uh, the term <laughs> Martian is because of my network. Uh, we had fuzzballs all over everywhere and they started falling over because ARP packets came in and the fuzzball had a bug in it that dealt with ARP packets. And so uh, uh, all the time came and, and asked, you know, where are these Martian packets coming from anyway? They were coming across my network. But uh, you know, there were different people doing different things. And the important thing that, that I thought happened was that they all worked in the same direction. They all worked in the same direction. And when it came about that we, we could actually run a link from here to there, uh, then we had, it, it was possible to interconnect and, and to carry things across that boundary. Uh, and, and so things kind of exploded in the mid-1990s because of that. Thank you, Fred. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. You're close to that, right? So I'm in, coming in a little bit late in 1991. In the summer of 1991, I met Dave with two guys called one Chumpe Kumon and the other is Aizu. And Aizu and Kumon, along with a guy called Joey T, Joey Chiito, who you probably all also know, Ito would have been about 14 at the time, um, had been dialing into US networks um, through the CompuServe network. And they'd been dialing into the source and the well. And they'd been using these bulletin board systems to discuss issues of community, the very earliest forms of social network. And this meeting, so Kumon, Aizu, Ito, they created these bulletin board systems, isolate, isolated communities across Japan. They had the Minoita, the Kawara network, the ones in Tokyo, in Zushi, 
all over the place. And what Dave really taught us was that the internet could actually bring these communities together. The internet was going to be this magical network that would hold all these little isolated communities. They could actually hold them together. So I think that conversation just, well, we have social networks, social media today. And I don't think we were thinking in any way about that. But we did know that the internet would connect people. And that's what Globcom, the institute I worked for for 20 years, really went ahead and did. These guys are all pioneers. I've been an observer. I was a lawyer for all of this, and it was a great fun. But the thing that Dave really taught beyond the technology that you're hearing about is introductions to policy. He was an advisor for the Clinton administration, as we spoke about the National uh, Information Infrastructure, NII, GII, all of these old words about how we would create global networks. Dave was the link to that. He introduced us to that. He introduced us to concepts of business. How would we get businesses online? How would we make money out of the internet? These came out of, you know, Dave Farber's mailing list and the way that he brought people together. The Farber list was the list where the internet happened and where we learned Does the mailing list still exist? Yeah. yeah. It does. How big is it? Uh, it's hard to tell. It's in excess of 20,000. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, I'll just briefly talk about it. Um, uh, Eric Block, who is an IBM vice president, uh, actually responsible for things like OSB, the 360 line, left IBM, retired from IBM, and went to the National Science Foundation. <coughs> I had known him well in his IBM days. I met him in the hall and said, How are those things? He said, good, except I don't have any time to sort of sit on my computer and find out what the hell is going on in the world. So I said, well, look, if I find anything interesting on the net, I'll forward it to you. Okay? A week later, I was doing it a week later, he said, can you add seven people from NSF and seven people from IBM? I said, sure. And then it grew from there, uh, quite interesting directions. Uh, one should comment that uh, I don't edit it, I just decide what goes out on it to keep the, the normal hassle of noise down to a minimum. But it's interesting, uh, it's an interesting phenomenon of creating a sort of a society. And yet it's still. Uh, and how fun. many people are that, maybe uh, Professor Lee, but how many are, are on that uh, uh, list from China? You mean for properties? It's called interesting people, by the way, because uh, Eric Watt was an interesting person, to put it mildly. Um, there's a fair number. The, the headache now is that people have established redistribution lists. And so um, there are a couple that go into the US government that I have no idea what, where they are. Um, yeah, before going to um, more recent in history, than the Nineteen one. <coughs> I'd like to speak something. Please. It's a really important on the inter history of the internet. And it's changed this region. And uh, uh, here's a story. So you want how many minutes to talk about this? <laughs> Two. <laughs> Two. <laughs> Two. Oh, okay. This is a, you have a, four. This you have a four. story. Probably uh, also I need the backup from a, a Dave's side, but uh, this is a story, and probably that you might uh, know something in the, the name. Uh, th that mailing list, and the, then I found out that the, um, that time, internet was developed by the engineers. He was an engineer, and the, everybody. And the, then the, that mailing list started to talk about the something uh, very much policy. So, uh, you know, what Adam said, that, uh, you know, Dave's message was very much, you know, started to include the communication with the government. And I was, uh, you know, sometimes uh, discussing with Dave, and then uh, why the engineer is talking to the government people? You know, that was uh, kind of a mystery, right, at that time. Um, uh, I'm, well, I'm not talking about the, my daily life now. Um, Anyway, so the, um, when I was starting the, that the computer network in this country, right? and the, then I had a very hard time, but it's a successfully connected uh, the internet, and the doctors probably can 
is that they're in, a, in a late uh, 80s, and they didn't really successfully connected within the you know uh, 80s for the uh, internet, right? To the internet, but uh, that was difficult, and uh, it was so difficult. And then I, I asked uh, you know the uh, U.S. friend and uh, you know the Steve who for the National Science Foundation, they have a lot of about that for the uh, a lot of help. Uh, from our point of view, uh, very point of view. And uh, then you know, what I asked, uh, you know, Vint, Dave, Larry Rand River, that, okay, we need uh, some kind of uh, authorizing mechanism, some kind of entity, association, uh, to, you know, kind of uh, authorize activities on uh, various countries, internet activities. Okay, that's what uh, I was, uh, I kept uh, asking them to create one. And uh, one day in an, uh, I believe it's a ninety, and then they you know uh, they they had an INET conference in Denmark, and then they they, okay. they had a plan of an ISO Internet Society uh, plan in you know, a ninety one, and uh, so then the Internet Society today uh, that was created. So it's a legal entity, umbrella of the ITF, and the. Uh, uh, sometimes helped a lot for W3C, and uh, that was the, at least at that time, a single legal entity uh, about the you know, kind of internet community uh, to cover the internet community. But that's because I asked them, because, uh, you know, okay, Japan, we had a very, very hard time uh, you know, developing the internet inside the country, and they connecting them, and they're working with the university. And, uh, what about the other countries? And we really need that kind of a mechanism, that the, 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 you know, dumping all the experiences and sharing the experiences with it. So that's the Internet Society. So uh, yeah, before I forget, I share this uh, history with everybody. Let me ask the, uh, the young man sitting next to that gentleman on the right with a sweater on about his experience with Dave Farber. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I don't know why Drew was putting his hand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I asked him. I asked him. So um, actually, uh, I met Drew when he was uh, undergraduate student. I was already in uh, Canada to do my PhD because there was no CS department in Cairo. And then I was working on the Unix version 7, and then June was working on the version 6. And then whenever I came back to KO, I was telling him that, uh, well, we don't do this, you know, we do this way, that way. And then uh, he started actually uh, JMF, as he mentioned. And then uh, we are uh, actually uh, setting up a gateway between US and J, uh, June's uh, network in uh, TI Tech. At that time, he was in TI Tech. We bought the two uh, trade racer, 1200 BPS model, to send all the emails from the JUN to the United States. So my uh, sound workstation was a gateway from Japan to the US. And then, and then this one was be after we connected Japan and US. And then there was a Pacific. I think computer network conference in Korea. After that, we took this picture. Ah, okay. And then Dave was kind enough to tell us about the CSNet movement. At that time, if I'm wrong, maybe you can correct me, but in the United States, there was, a, I think, first generation of digital divide. People who grew up in the connected universities or research institutes, they really would like to work in the connected, namely the Apple.net community. Don't want or to the disconnected company or disconnected universities. So then Dave and Larry and many other guys came up with the notion of CSNet, which will connect all the colleges, small colleges, uh, state universities, everyone can do uh, email, FTP, and so on. So that was first United uh, Let me just amplify a little bit on that because it's interesting. CSNet actually was uh, Larry and myself and several others <coughs> proposal to the NSF, mainly caused by the fact that the computer science community was, uh, except for a couple of universities who were on the ARPANET, uh, stuck with telephones to talk to each other in US mail. This is slow, 
put it mildly. This was post Sputnik. Every part, every school in the United States wanted to have a computer science department. It was a hard thing, so you had departments with one systems person, one language person. That doesn't work. You need you need colleagues. So we went to the NSF twice actually uh, to organize a network for computer science. Okay. And the NSF funded those with some interesting criteria that they said you got three years if you can't raise the money from the departments to support yourself, then they don't want you. So uh, part of the thing was an interesting financial riot. Uh, we cured that by charging industry research labs like Bell Labs and IBM an outrageous amount of money to interact with CSNet. They were willing because they had kid, kids they wanted to hire from the university. And the first thing out of the question they had for the companies, are you connected to CSNet so we could talk to our friends? So they were willing to pay. And we also made a few, uh, uh, op Opera and uh, CSNet had a bilateral agreement to pass traffic across the period, the first period relationship. Uh, no cost because NSF and Opera could managed to transfer money if their life depended on it. So by definition, it was equal, which it wasn't. whole set of things uh, got developed, which sort of grandfathered on forever. It was an interesting time because, you know, there was both technical invention in the ITF uh, and in the community, a relatively small, tightly knit group of people who talked to each other. Which caused us a lot of problems, which I will talk about yeah. later. By the way, that that was just uh, okay. I just mentioned that was before a cyber attack era. No one was actually trying to attack us. Right. So we're friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we speak. No. There was a that. Um, in the UUCP? Yeah, the first protocol he developed in the the, uh, the mail system I used over the international link and uh, that protocol went something wrong uh, <laughs> the email was retransmitted yes yes, yes. and uh, we ran the software it was a top over the x25 bucket and the uh, retransmit error and the uh, retransmit Retransmit. That's it. Retransmit. Retransmit. <laughs> over the you know the packet based charging yeah. <laughs> between the US and Japan. <laughs> and uh, then uh, it, it's gonna like a you know Pakeshi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Pakeshi repo, Pakeshi packet in that uh, you know. So it's so kind of packet big and, and then a huge so bill <laughs> came from a candy DI. <laughs> and uh, then uh, it's a kind of a Four months, four months uh, uh, amount of the Professor Ishida's <laughs> research money. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fact. Put blame on Dave Crocker. I I am a sort of an outsider, uh, to, to, uh, but have been working uh, very closely uh, with the internet community. So let me uh, try to put the story in, in, in context. Um, I, I got my first job out of college. I mean, I, I graduated from the economics department of uh, Tokyo University. Uh, I got my first, the first job I got was in 1982. And I got it uh, at, uh, of all places, uh, NTT. And, but the reason why I thought NTT was, I mean, the telecommunications industry was going to be interesting uh, I, I guess there were two drugs. I mean, by the way, 1982 was the year AT&T got divested, and uh, NTT uh, was uh, also broken up uh, in, uh, or privatized uh, in 1985. And the big driver for the ch big change in telecommunication industry by, uh, back then, I guess there were two factors. One was the microwave technology in the uh, 1970s that created opportunities for new entrants into what used to be a completely economy, a scale economy, 
uh, industry and AT&T AT monopoly and NTT monopoly. I mean, it was a monopoly world. It was, it was around 1982 that things started getting very interesting. And one reason was the microwave. Uh, uh, number two, the second reason was, I, I guess, uh, what the, uh, June mentioned, the X, X25 uh, network. I mean, really the dawn of uh, computer communications. Uh, that, have, uh, that, again, instead of telephone companies uh, switching everything, uh, you, could, you, could you could have uh, a computer, computers uh, switching messages. But that was illegal. These, these guys were walking on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Criminals. I, I am, I am, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think, I think for you, uh, it's, it's now the, the time has already passed, so yes. you can confess. You can confess, yes. What did you do? Did you, did you? Yeah, we did the many things, right? Okay. You should confess. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so these, these guys are suspects. <laughs> but that, <laughs> uh, so, so that, that, that was around 1982, but this is before internet. Okay. I remember, I think at Harvard Business School, I think it was around, I, 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 was, I was an MBA student and DBA student at Harvard Business School, and I think it was 88 when the uh, IT department of Harvard Business School started supporting uh, IP broadband. Initially, I thought it was just one of, uh, an additional protocol. Uh, that uh, I mean, I, I, I was already a user of Bitnet by then, and, uh, uh, but, but then it, it took me about two years as a social scientist to appreciate that the uh, IP protocol is completely different. I mean, the social implication, the destructive nature of, uh, of uh, internet. I mean, I was, uh, I was supported by Nippon Telegraph and Telephone to go with Harvard Business School, so uh, that it, was it, it had the potential of destroying the business model uh, of my sponsor. <laughs> Yes, I did. Uh, yes, I did. I, I returned to NTT uh, and tried to convince that uh, rather than being on the on the side of uh, somebody that gets destroyed, we might as well just adopt it. It was a huge. I mean, I, mean, I, I guess the networks and the still it is uh, with KDD, uh, but uh, I, I remember myself. Uh, Making the argument that uh, rather than letting KDD host the internet uh, uh, C exchange, uh, NTT should do it. But of course, the technology back then, I mean, the internet protocol uh, had a potential of destroying telephony, which is, uh, which will, which will, I mean, of course, it had, it did, it did. So, uh, but then uh, I, I thought that's around when, that, that's, so that's why I left NTT. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, there's, there's right here. <laughs> Smart move. I used to be on NTT Docomo's uh, advisory board for a while. It's busy. Uh, two things show you the disconnect between, at that point, uh, and Bell Labs developed the 300 volt acoustic modem many, many moons ago for data. And the researchers thought they could go 500 volt. 300 was what a teletact did. Mm -hmm. And uh, AT&T said, don't bother. There's no, no reason to ever want more than 300 volt. <laughs> so right. Yeah, there's also, uh, uh, many of us uh, read Paul Barron's stuff on package switching. Always a close friend uh, and a mentor. Around. And when I was at Bell Labs, we wanted to give that a try, research. And we asked AT&T, since we had to tell them what we were doing, uh, they said, don't bother, there's no business in data. So again, wow. And one final thing in Japan, uh, when I early came over here, 
um, from some senior people who are now sadly passed away. I was told that no Japanese would ever communicate with another Japanese with text over <laughs> over these silly things. That just wasn't the culture. It's a part, it's just an example of how technology can change culture. Uh, it's not necessarily <laughs> anyway, so easily. Okay, well, I'm going to leave it at that. We're going to switch now uh, to kind of more of a question answer mode. Um, I hope that Dave will always try to get the first reply, but then I invite everybody else to jump in. And we're going to kind of do this as a ping pong. You know, I've got some questions I want to ask this guy. And so I'm going to throw one out there, and then I'd like to open it up, have you throw one, and then I've got a big storehouse of good questions. So um, if we can work together on that. Um, you've been, I know, thinking of what you want to ask Dave, uh, and uh, this is your chance. But let me start off. Um, with this set of observations. Uh, we're sitting here today, and the World Wide Web is 25 years old, maybe 26, actually. And it's kind of moved from the domain of professors and geeks to a worldwide communications platform. Uh, I think one of the things that you should take away is that it was the professors, it was the universities where the, where the, where the internet was born. And that's something, indeed, that you know has kind of um, motivated uh, a lot of the work that I've been doing here. Because I think it's time for the universities uh, to get much more engaged on the policy side of internet questions, uh, as well as uh, their original role of kind of driving the technology. So, you know, the internet's been around for 20 years, and, and that's pretty good. But it seems, and this is the question, first question I want to throw to Dave, is we seem to have lost uh, that sense of community and trust that underpinned it. These guys were all friends. They had shared experiences. They talked easily to each other. Uh, Dave actually has 20,000 friends, as I understand, on his list. But the, uh, the worldwide internet now is approaching 3 billion. It's an entirely different sort of thing. And, um, you know, it was really that trust and community that kind of fueled a lot of the innovation and change on the internet. These guys talked to each other, they came up with ideas, they shared, they challenged each other. So my question to Dave, have we lost it now? It isn't all about trust and community uh, anymore, and does it matter? I think the internet is uh, quietly adapting itself to the real world, and the real world is not necessarily friendly. And you can see this in a lot of the social networks, that they have all the bad properties of not only the culture of the country that the person's in, but the culture of the world that's creating an interesting change. On the other hand, it is remarkable the benefits. Uh, you know, the, early on, the notion was that the internet would destroy uh, culture because of it. Suddenly, everybody would see the same thing. And it has, in many cases, the exact opposite reaction. Uh, let me give an example. In the U.S., we have Indian tribes, Indian nations. Uh, they've been just largely destroyed as, as living in one place. They're spread around the country and the world. And the people were losing their identity very seriously. Many of the tribes use the internet to reestablish the identity. And now, in fact, if you're an Oneida Indian, uh, no matter where you are, you're part of that community. Uh, some of the churches, the, the Mormon church, specifically used that very early on. So I think it's it, there's a, a seesaw going on. It gives you the, the ability for me to communicate to people I have never seen and probably will never see, and they've become friends. Uh, I don't. I have different ideas than they have, and we can communicate. On the other hand, there are people which I prefer not, not to talk to. And, you know, I have, I know this have to do that. It's a very complicated space. Fred, do you have a comment? Sure. So, I think it's on. Okay. Um, yeah, my perspective here is basically a change of my life. I grew up just outside Cleveland, Ohio, 
And driving across town to my grandmother's house, which was a 45 minute drive, was an interminably long drive. Uh, I just, as a child, couldn't imagine going 45 minutes across town. And now I find myself, you know, this afternoon, Rod Van Meter and I had an interview with a student from Kale who wants to be an intern. And, you know, I met her on the internet. Uh, I've uh, been able to review a master's degree thesis in Cape Town University. I find myself mentoring students in Australia and other parts of the world. The, the internet has been a vehicle to bring, to make my world smaller and to introduce me to people and be able to make a contribution in many places. So Shirley and I have done actually quite a bit of work together and literally on opposite sides of the world, not only physically, geographically, but politically. And yeah, you know, we've worked together. So. Okay, well thank you. Um, uh, do we have a question from uh, the audience? Okay, yeah, in the back there. Please identify yourselves and we'll get a mic to you. I'm Yumi Ohashi. Uh, I am um, I can Japan data, but today I'm here in my personal capacity. And thank you very much for uh, sharing with us your experience and your insight into the uh, foundation of the internet. And my question is. Uh, as the fathers of the internet, I would like to have your views on your children or a younger <laughs> generation. And uh, do you, how do you view the younger, uh, younger generation uh, who are now involved in development or research or anything related to the internet? And how, what do you expect them? And uh, I would like to hear your message to them uh, to help them get more involved in the development of the internet. Thank you. Yeah, let me stop that off. I have strong opinions on, uh, on some parts of it. Uh, certainly the, the younger generation has carried the ball quite nicely. Uh, maybe a little too nicely. Uh, I look at the younger generation of academics and uh, I worry a lot about their unwillingness to take gambles. And part of it is the, the culture of the university, where gambling is, uh, you know, a thing you do when you're a full professor with tenure and you're about to retire almost. Uh, as a young faculty member, gambling is a dangerous game. You shoot the dice and if you lose, you lose big. And I find that's made them very conservative, which worries me. Because at least my time, and I think all the people here, we were willing to take chances. Uh, you know, maybe we had a, a better life then because there weren't as many. But gambling was, was a reasonable thing to do. And it is part of science. You gamble. You gamble, you're right. And sometimes you're wrong. And that's fine to learn from it. Uh, one final comment. And then I, I should stop talking so much. But a, a good friend of mine. That's why we're here. <laughs> there are others here too. Good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Hamming, Richard Hamming, who is, for those of double E's, Hamming codes, but uh, he was probably one of the best uh, applied mathematicians we've ever seen, uh, said something interesting. I'll get the, the names wrong, but some French mathematician uh, was saying that he was great because he had stood on the shoulders of those who preceded them. In my field, computer science, we stand on each other's toes. We don't build on the on what others have done. We tend to ignore it, and that worries me about the younger generation a lot. Okay, well, let me throw out a uh, kind of a related question. And uh, actually, um, I'd like Ching Lee, who's going to at least firmly back the mic, to try to answer this one. Uh, so, Asia is now. <coughs> You know the center uh, for the internet in terms of uh, subscribers, and increasingly it's, it's a center for innovation. I think companies in Asia are really proving that they can innovate, produce new models and business services, etc. Uh, so, 
What contributions, and this is I think a good group to ask this to, has Asia already made uh, to the internet? And how do you think it's going to use its new leadership role? Uh, if this is where the innovation and growth are taking place, if this is where the subscribers are growing, if this is where the center of the universe of the internet is shifting, what, is it, what does it mean? Um, and will, and, and this is the important question for uh, Professor Lee, will an internet that's centered around Asia have a different set of values and institutions from the internet today? The uh, Internet today is uh, uh, characterized by transparency, by openness of access, by ubiquity, uh, scale, uh, a lot of different words to describe the Internet today. Is there a different concept or a different direction that Asia is going to take the Internet? Because the days when Europe, the US, and Japan sit around and define the future, I think are slipping away. Professor Lee? And then I'm going to ask Dave to comment on your comment. <laughs> oh, okay. There are two things. One is the contribution of the Asians for the development of the Internet. I believe there are two things. One thing is scalability. Actually, the success of the Internet architecture is it, it's kind of scale. So, and because, like, for example, China, there are lots of people and the Internet users. Actually, okay, my experience. At the beginning, when like we learned a lot from like uh, John Wai, Fred Baker, Ken Chiang, and uh, Nandi Web, and Ishida, our, our friends, and uh, and later actually we found that the scale of the internet in China is larger than that. So there are new challenges. That part we can contribute. That's the first thing. And the second is diversity. That's very important because the East has a different culture. So. That's, for example, the language encoding, all those kind of things, uh, and deep thinking, whatever things, that's good. However, on the other hand, there are also the challenges of the internet. And uh, <clears throat> currently, I'm worried the fragmentation of the internet because encryption, all those kind of things, that probably can divide. But my own theory is the difference is not between different countries, but the people and the governments. Actually, people, whatever, in the United States and the China speak in the same language, and the, the governments are other, and community, they have different opinions. So, <laughs> like, uh, so the That's academics can work together, and the users can work together, and the government can work together. So That's different beings and the government, different species. That's yeah. what we do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Governor said, uh, realize that even, even within people, uh, different regions of the United States have really different ways of looking at things. Uh, a New Yorker and a person from Mississippi are almost two different animals. Uh, and it's very hard to overcome that. The internet has homogenized a lot, but I think what homogenized more in the U.S. certainly was the mobility of people. Uh, but again, that's a, a skim of society that doesn't tend to happen with people who are uh, at the bottom of the totem pole. Uh, governments have responsibilities, and unfortunately, in my view, governments no longer do any long-term planning. They react. Uh, I was telling so many people here, we had a meeting in Washington maybe a year ago of some fairly heavy weighted people, not this way, but <laughs> other ways. Uh, and, and the joint opinion of everybody, of the five people who were there is that nobody's doing any long term planning anymore. Companies aren't. They do quarter, next quarter, maybe next year planning. Uh, governments just have. At least the U.S. government and the European governments have gotten out of the business long-term planning. The, the long-term planning is the next election. And that's, that's dangerous in the world we're in. Uh, if we had taken that attitude in the 40s, we probably wouldn't be here. People worried about the long-term thing. And I think we're at that point now where we have to think 
further ahead of what is what we're doing now stable, or yield a stable world society. And that's, that's why I think the policy side of the house is a very important thing. You know, technology will go forward, but getting people to think out the policy and societal implications of, of what's becoming an increasingly digital society is very important and not being done enough. And certainly not being done internationally. Yeah. We're going to be talking exactly about that subject a little bit later, uh, John. Yeah, I think, uh, no, yeah, that's, uh, <coughs> I, I, I really agree uh, uh, with the David's comment that uh, I'm looking at the Rod face, but he's doing it. And I'm, I'm, I keep asking him that when do your uh, quantum networking is going to be uh, available? <laughs> and uh, then his answer is, you know, um, maybe 50 years. Years, <laughs> you know, so so that's that's fine. But uh, then, then uh, probably that law about the kind of a long term view and the, uh, all the continuous efforts for the achieving something for the future uh, is uh, only can be done by young people, right? So that's to be your answer to Yumi San that uh, you know young people can 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 do the you know, to dream about it, and then you know, they can they can do their continuous efforts. Probably, what I was, like, you know, thirty years old, maybe, and, and at that time, and at that time, I I only think about the kind of developing of the internet, and then uh, it's, it's, I I just I do think that like, I had a long term view, but I decided. I mean, push myself to work on this and, uh, and continuously address, and uh, then uh, therefore I did the uh, efforts for 30 years, you know, 40 years on uh, this area. So uh, I think, uh, you know, answering to your husband's question, then uh, young people do the whatever you want, you like, and uh, then continue challenging, and uh, that kind of thing, only young people. You know, I'm very happy as I look towards the back, I see uh, quite a few people from uh, some of the internet classes that I'm teaching at, uh, at Kale, and I think uh, what Jun said is exactly right. Every time that I walk into the classroom, I ask myself, where is the next Jun Marai? You know, even more to the point, you know, where is the next Mark Zuckerberg? I think you all hear me saying that. Uh, the fact is, is that there they are, Jun and Hide, uh, with Dave. Uh, many, many years ago, and look what they've accomplished. There's three billion people on the network that they were basically constructing, and Asia now is driving that change. And the question is, where are we going to be? I think that's, that's the big message we want you all to, uh, to take away from today. Uh, another question, please. Yes. So please identify yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Tadashi Ongoshi from Keio University, uh, Faculty of Environmental Innovation, uh, now the uh, Graduate School of Indian Governance. And uh, when I look at that picture and standing here, when we talk about the history of the internet from 30 years ago to now, this is a review. And uh, we are looking back and we are watching the consequences of what happened. But when you going back to 30 years ago, you might be able to have some other option. For example, my question is, why did you choose this internet or internet working topic as your work? Did you have any other option? <laughs> or, or is this topic attractive enough already? Well, I think, let me talk to myself. You know, I've been in every field of computer science. Uh, I think there is, except maybe AI, who I did that or that. I had better taste to go into that. that. That was a nasty comment I retract. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, growing up at Bell Labs taught me is that there are interesting things out there. And it's a shame to waste your time, not waste your time, it's a, 
It's a shame to just have one type of wine. You should sample the wine. And sometimes, for instance, in programming language, I realized that I would sort of a dead end in the sense of I couldn't see the next step. So I went off and did something else. You know, I kept a notebook saying, well, someday I must get back to that. And sometimes it's accidental uh, that you're involved in things. Uh, the internet was sort of a combination of knowing Paul Barron and, and also picking up some weird students when I went to academia, like Pastel and Marco Petras. Uh, I'd get better, better people to have as students. So students often push you into the direction. Certainly John did, uh, and Paul you know, sometimes frustrating ways push me in that direction. But uh, academics should always have good students. It helps. But be flexible. You know, they, again, the, <coughs> the academic part for those here tend to focus you, and that would be a shame to get focused. Uh, there's just a huge number of interesting ideas out there, and uh, you know, take advantage of that. By going to a buffet, you don't want to eat only one thing. That's my personal opinion. I'm going to jump in with a question now, and then we'll open it again. Um, you know, uh, one of the privileges of organizing a, a conference like this is I get to sit down and have a cup of coffee with uh, uh, Dave across the street, and I said, you know, Dave, what are you working on these days? And I he said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I was just looking out at a cybersecurity conference, and we were talking about how to secure the internet better. Jim was there with me, a lot of other people. Uh, took us in say. Um, you know, but the fact was, of course, the internet was not designed for security. These guys all knew each other. They trusted each other. You know, at one time, I suspect that Dave Farber knew everybody <coughs> that was on the internet personally. In one form or another. He may not have known their face, but they had been corresponding with each other. Remember, he's just talking about computer scientists and computer science departments talking about each other. But, you know, those days were clearly over. I mean, cyber warfare, cyber attacks, cyber threat, uh, threats to uh, damage to critical infrastructure, they're on everybody's word, on everybody's uh, lips. So the question is, and I'd like to, th to throw it to, to Dave and to some of the others, do we need a bottom-up redesign of the internet? Uh, can we continue to stumble along with what you guys put together, uh, basically to send emails to each other uh, several years back? Dave? I'll take the first crack, but I hope I'll just do it because I suspect we might not be in agreement. <coughs> I think obviously we have to continue. There's no way we can replace what we have. Uh, just pragmatically, people are still running Windows 1 on machines that no longer are uh, maintained. You know, we, we have to keep it going. Society depends on it. On the other hand, uh, there is a serious problem in my view on security. And uh, people are at Fairly high levels of corporations and others are panicking about it because you know, we built we built something on top of a bunch of shaky grounds and we have to try to patch it as well as we can. But that combined with the fact that I think we can face a new generation of communications that may change the the very structure of the way we talk between machines. What well, gives the opportunity to do that? Uh, suggest that maybe it's time to sort of sit back and say, okay, let's start over again at least for these critical services and let's see, let's project out to the terabit networks and, and uh, you know, rational cloud structures and secure process laws and let's see what we can do. And, uh, I was at a meeting uh, the, before I came, right before I came here where the NSF put a bunch of researchers and people from enterprise networks, big ones like Citibank and, and Chase and, and, and even the NSA, but that's, we didn't get much out of him. Uh, <laughs> and they, they were, uh, now they have major problems and they don't want to face a future where all they have is problems. 
and it's getting to the point where I think we have to go off in corner. I suggested that we try a sort of brand challenge of designing a future really trustable computer system, trustable networking environment, and nobody thought it was a bad idea. How you go about it, I have my own ideas. I'm sure everybody here would have their own ideas. But that's, that's good. That means that there's an opportunity to innovate. And I'd like to see that being an international thing, not just the US or not just Europe do, trying to do it. The, the talent's just too distributed. And it's too hard a problem. You know, if, if I may rephrase the same question, uh, is there a way to secure the net without losing the benefits of distributed and open network? I guess that's the question. Uh, well, I don't. I don't happen to think so. I don't happen to think that we. You know, it's, it's somewhat akin to if you look at operating systems. And look at the inter-arrival time of patches to fix security problems. They're getting faster and faster and faster. Now, if you don't design, I think it was Ford that said, uh, quality is design rule one. You know, security, if you don't build it in at the bottom, you are, you're going to have endless problems of patching it. And I just don't know how to get around that problem. I guess, uh, uh, yeah, just quickly, I try to. I think only the challenge is where we uh, verify the software component or certified component or even touch the speed. If we succeed the much faster defending speed than the attacking speed, right? So, defenders movement in the community. Um, so, with the, some software technologies, then uh, I don't trust the. Uh, Complete technologies because human is using it, but still, we should think about the penetration speed of attack versus defending speed. So I think only the things is keep moving. And then, well, 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 the we cannot build a static system. We cannot build a static. The answer is yes to, to your question, right. but but you, your your question basically question itself is wrong. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Dave already said that this is a this is a real world to utilize the internet. Okay, so, this, so most of the security things is not the problem of the internet. Okay, the internet connected world, and then there is a security issue, the cyber war issue, and the cyber crime issue, cyber attack issue. But uh, so um, there is a very few uh, problems. <coughs> Network broken technology is going to be the causes of those issues. Very few, few, few of them, right? This is uh, more toward the social human users and uh, you know that kind of area to utilize these uh, tools uh, for their own purposes. And uh, then the most of the cybersecurity issues caused from that one. So uh, you know then uh, you know when we want to fix that things for the future. Then we really need, uh, you know, assuming that the internet, digital communication is globally existing, and uh, a lot of capacity of the requirement, and uh, you know, uh, is uh, satisfied by the technology. And uh, what kind of a society we should we should create? What kind of security and what kind of safety net are we going to create as a as a, as a world? You know, that's not the uh, technology issue. Only, but also the an equipment of a social issue. So that's number one. And the second one is that uh, uh, getting back to the question, question. And uh, what uh, you, you know, you've been working for thirty years. And, and, and what's the whole type of thing? And uh, to me, it's a it's distributed processing. I mean, so the doctor and myself started as a distributed uh, system. And distribute the system to connect all the computers, all the other things maybe now, and uh, in, in, in this planet, everything connected, and then do the distributed processing. So, so something good for the people and the society. If that is the goal, the internet is just the one step for that goal. 
I, I just tried to add a bit uh, different view. We were in uh, all three of us in uh, Okinawa talking about the cyber security. There was a guy actually who is in charge of Olympic 2020 to be held in Tokyo. He has uh, almost like a screen. Tell us about the very fundamental risk management methodology. We really would like to have a total risk management for the Olympic 2020. So there are human aspects, as you said, but there are some networking aspects as well. Many people carrying the untrusted mobile phone, you know, coming from Narita or coming from Haneda, and then they may destroy our mobile communication system. So they were very worried about, you know, uh, we have a complete methodology to deal with that, such kind of risk management. So not only uh, no, 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 I'm not saying that the technology, there, there is not a room for the technology to be improved or the technology responsibility is not existing type of thing. Of, 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 you know, but the improvement, it's, a, it's a, a lot of things, including the security issue. Uh, a lot of new requirements coming in and then you know, a lot of new technology has to be developed and designed uh, with the consideration of the security. So that's basically what I mean. Okay, so as you stated your question, um, what you were wondering was whether the time has come to drop back 15 yards and kick as hard as we can. Uh, <laughs> should, we, should we redesign the network from scratch? The interesting thing is that we've been doing that since it was originally developed. You know, the, the internet as it started out was all about point-to-point -point lines, and we added these things called local area networks. <laughs> which were networks that didn't cross a legal boundary and nothing to do with the technology involved. It was a legal question. Uh, but okay, you know, from suddenly we've got Ethernet, we've got Fiddy, we've got, Fiddy, we've got you know, whatever it came up to. Uh, and that was at one layer. And at the next layer, you know, we're now talking about IPv6 and uh, content centric networking and you know, different approaches to what's the next step. Uh, at the transport layer, uh, TCP used to be king, in many respects it still is, but uh, Google Quick is becoming a very important player there. And looking at uh, actually embedding the transport in the application and running it over UDP with uh, you know, that's becoming an important technology. And oh, by the way, every five minutes we've got a new application. You know, we're constantly redeveloping and, and, and so on and so forth. And security, I think simply needs to be part of that. Uh, improving the routing architecture with RPKI or whatever the next solution is, uh, making sure that we know that the routes are valid, and, uh, and providing perhaps even a next generation backbone routing protocol. Um, I, I don't think we have to drop that 15 and get what we do have to do is pick up the ball and run. Let me disagree with you. Uh, I said we have to continue to improve what we have, but we're still in a world where, in fact, we can't give a person a computer system that can't be penetrated, uh, can't be uh, malware in it. Uh, the hardware itself is, uh, to put it mildly, uh, has problems. Uh, you know, we're, everything's on the operating systems that we have to deal with. Are nightmares and they're not going to get any better. We we have an independent thing, the net communication network. We can we can become somewhat more robust on. That's where a lot of the processes are, th are being while the work is being done. But unless we solidify the bottom, unless I can build a computer where I can't have some guy send the malware that destroys my machine, we're going to be in trouble. That's that's the problem I want to solve. I'd be perfectly happy if I could get that layer replacing, and even if it runs with with uh, the current uh, internet software on top of it, I happen to think that we run into troubles there as the speeds of communication increase. Uh, I don't think we can go up to a terabit very com comfortably with the current stuff. Uh, but, you know, that's an interesting experiment. It was hard enough to get to a gate. Uh, in, directly into the processor. And, you know, there are applications which are going to force issues, and it's the job of the research community to 
understand where the future is. And there's another thing which is to improve uh, sort of our, our daily life and they operate concurrently. I don't think we're spending enough time in the future. Uh, okay, my understanding is like usability and the security are always trade-offs. I like to see the new design of the architecture, but usability should be the first priority, not the security. I can tell you a story, like uh, some computers in China, some kind of vulnerability or something. So uh, actually the order is shut off that computer. So in other words, if you want to guess the DDoS, then you should shut off your own computer. Right? So that's not good. And uh, it's very hard to design secure architecture. But my <coughs> thing, my thought is we need to control the power. If one party has too much power, then it is not secure. That's my understanding. Okay, um, we spent uh, uh, almost two days talking about these issues uh, down in down in Okinawa, uh, but I think I learned more in the last ten minutes uh, than I did in those two days of discussions. Uh, uh, but what I'd like to do is now is we are running close to the time for uh, the networking, where I hope that you all have a chance to meet with Dave, to meet with some of the other pioneers of the internet over coffee in the next room. But I've got time for one more question. Anybody have a burning uh, issue? Let me get a mic to you. Okay, please tell us your name. Um, nice to meet you. Um, thank you for your personal history about internet, uh, internet technology. Um, I'm Mariko Kobayashi from Keio University, as I see campus. Yeah, um, I'm a junior student in the college. And um, I want to ask, uh, ask Mr. Dave, um, so why did you decide to distribute the technology on the internet to Asia? Why? <laughs> <laughs> well, besides, besides the fact that we had friends over here who we thought we wanted to communicate with. But largely, the, the reason we distributed to Asia and any place else that would take it is we wanted to talk to people, we wanted to work with people. We had people in, in Japan that we wanted to work with. We wanted to understand what they were doing. And, you know, back then, uh, we were in the days where Call California was a major budget crusher. Remember those days with long distance and you used to pay an outrageous amount of money to call Asia, but, and we wanted to change that. Also, we had a new toy. The new toy was this this thing, and you know, people uh, like to see other people use their toys. And we we did that because we thought, and it proved to be correct, that it would revolutionize our community, the computer science community. And the fact that they could communicate, and it did, uh, it's spectacular. And uh, you know, it grew just for historical purposes. The uh, the NSF at the end of three years realized that they had bear uh, by the tail, to use an American term. Uh, and because people were coming into computer science departments and saying, "We want to use your network. We want it too." Uh, so we had the NREN and the you know, NSF and that, etc. And, and we spawned commercial networks because companies were coming in and saying they wanted to do that. Uh, but I think Asia was, was uh, you know, Japan at that point especially, was a hotbed of innovation. Uh, there were good people here that we knew and we wanted to, uh, them and, uh, and anybody else who would join in to us. Okay, well excellent question. We're going to um, uh, close down things briefly. Uh, we're going to be having coffee uh, between now and, uh, and five o'clock. I really urge you to um, uh, come up and talk informally uh, with Dave and, and some of the other professors and colleagues that uh, have worked on these issues. I think it's a great chance for you to ask uh, personally that question that you're looking to ask. We're going to keep, uh, come back here at, uh, at five o'clock. Uh, we have a special announcement and we'll try to finish up by 5.30. But to encourage you to stay uh, past five, 
Uh, at 5 o'clock, we'll have a group photo. If you want to be with the pioneers of the uh, uh, this will be this will be your chance. So, coffee served in the next room. I hope to see all of you back uh, here about 5 o'clock.